Welcome to another episode of the Neuroanatomy series that's being run by Nansig. Uh, my name is Robin Borchert. I'm a clinical neuroscience AFP. I'm an F1 at the moment. And in this episode, we're going to be discussing the brain's vasculature. So we'll first outline what we're actually going to cover here. So this is really going to be a basic overview of the brain's vasculature, so how blood flows into and out of the brain. I'd say it's mainly aimed at medical students, particularly in their preclinical years. And we'll start out by discussing the arterial supply and the venous supply, specifically kind of from an anatomical perspective. But we're also going to tie in the clinical relevance of knowing this anatomy. And that will come in the form of, for example, stroke, venous thrombosis, things like that. And then at the end, I'll give you some further reading and other resources you can use if you want to examine this further. So the brain has a very high demand for nutrients. And because of this, it receives a disproportionate amount of blood relative to the actual size of the brain. So in terms of cardiac output, it receives about 15% of the cardiac output, which is quite high. So we'll look at the arterial supply now, and we'll start with the heart, which I'll outline here. So first we have the blood coming out of the heart in the ascending aorta, and then the descending aorta. And one of the first branches, or the first branch of the aorta, is the brachiocephalic artery, which at this point splits into the right subclavian and into the right common carotid. So this is one of our first arteries that's leading into the brain. The left common carotid on the other side is actually a branch directly from the aorta. So it's the second branch of the aorta, which becomes the left common carotid. At around this point, um, on both sides, the common carotid splits into the internal and external carotid arteries. So I'm highlighting here the external carotid arteries, and these mainly supply the neck and the head. Um, but not the intracranial structures, so we're not going to focus on them here. The intracranial structures are mainly supplied by the internal carotid arteries, which I'm highlighting now. Other structures here, which are of relevance, are the vertebral arteries. So we have the right vertebral artery here coming off of the right subclavian, and we have the left vertebral artery here coming off of the left subclavian. And they supply uh, blood into the brain as well, and we'll look into a bit more detail into these arteries on the next slide. In terms of clinical relevance, so the carotids are quite important because especially around this area where I highlighted before where it can split into the external and internal carotids, you can get furring of the artery. And for example, this can involve a buildup of a plaque, and the plaque can stenose the artery to the point where it's not able to supply the brain with as much blood as it used to be able to. Another issue that can arise from this is that bits of the plaque can break off and embolize into the brain, causing a stroke. Now in these situations where the stenosis is very severe, or for example, if someone's had a transient ischemic attack where they've had symptoms of a stroke, um, but they haven't been permanent, these individuals can be referred to the vascular surgeons and they can be reviewed for an operation uh, such as a carotid endarterectomy. And what this involves is you can clamp the arteries above and below the plaque, and you can cut it open and remove the plaque and then sew it up again, as they did here. And this reduces the risk of having, for example, strokes in the future. So the next slide, we're going to have a look at the brain's vasculature as if we're under the brain looking upwards. So we're looking at the brain from the bottom here, and just to give you some orientation based on the, the arteries we were discussing in the last slide. So right here, we got the internal carotids that are coming up into the brain. And we also have the vertebral arteries, which are coming up here, and they derive from the subclavian arteries bilaterally. And so the vertebral arteries, as you can see, they converge up here and they form the basilar artery. And together, the vertebral arteries and the basilar artery, they're quite important for supplying the upper part of the spinal cord. Uh, the, the brain stem, which is this kind of area that lies underneath these arteries, as well as these big hemispheres on either side, which comprise the cerebellum. But moving upwards, uh, what's very important, especially in medical school and exams, just knowing your anatomy in terms of clinical relevance, 
um, is identifying this kind of make-believe circle which is formed by the arteries surrounding this area. And this is called the Circle of Willis. And the fact that it's a circle uh, isn't by accident. Um, there are some evolutionary benefits to it. So for example, if there's any compromise to the arterial architecture around here, there's collateral supply due to its, um, its structure which can, can help uh, supply blood to that region that's in need. So the main arteries that you want to know in this area are the, uh, the first of all, there's the anterior cerebral arteries, and these are joined by an anterior communication, which is just at the top in the middle here. You have the middle cerebral arteries, which are these big ones that come off in the middle. Um, these are very clinically relevant because they're a common site of ischemic strokes. And this kind of makes sense because if you have a, a clot or an embolus that derives from the heart or the carotids and they shoot up and through these internal carotids that I drew before with these arrows, they enter through the internal carotids and they just need to make a short journey into these middle cerebral arteries where they can lodge and cause an ischemic stroke. And then at the back you have the posterior cerebral arteries. And together all of these arteries um, make or comprise the components of the, the circle of Willis. So we talked a bit about stroke, but there's another clinically relevant topic to this. So the circle of Willis is a common site of aneurysms, and these are specifically berry aneurysms. So on the bottom left here, you can see there's aneurysms are these outpouchings of the arteries. And these can be asymptomatic for a long time, but um, they, they can cause some problems. So if they get big enough, they can compress local structures causing symptoms. But one of the, the more feared complications is that they can rupture. And when they rupture, they bleed into that area and they can cause things like subarachnoid hemorrhages. So on the bottom right, we have a CT. It's not the best CT and you might be able to find better examples online. But if you can see in the middle, there's this hyperdense area here with kind of like finger-like projections. And this is quite a um, classic image of a subarachnoid hemorrhage on a CT scan. So we'll look at the regional supply of these individual arteries now, and at the bottom we have this reference image which we just looked at. So let's first look at the anterior cerebral arteries, which I'm drawing at the bottom again, just for your reference. So if we look at the top images, um, on the left we have a lateral view, so we're looking at the brain from the side, and on the right we have a medial view, so that's as if we are looking from the side still, but we cut the brain in half. So the anterior cerebral arteries supply the region in yellow. So that's like quite a frontal region here at the front, but also there's a quite a significant medial aspect that the anterior cerebral artery supplies as well. Moving on to the middle cerebral artery, and this is the one, and these big ones that come off the, the side of the circle of Willis. This matches up to the red area, and this red area, it's quite a big area of brain. It has a lot of uh, functions that, that it involves. So there are functions such as uh, movement, sensation, language, and if you get a clot stuck in one of these middle cerebral arteries and you get a, a resulting ischemic stroke, it can affect the functions that are relevant to this area of the brain. The posterior cerebral artery, which I'm drawing again at the bottom here, um, this supplies the blue region. So this is a region that's mainly uh, in the temporal lobe in the back of the brain. And so, for example, the back of the brain has uh, the, the uh, visual function. And so this can be affected when you have an ischemic stroke affecting the posterior cerebral artery along with some other symptoms as well. All right, so we'll have a bit of a deeper dive into stroke, specifically ischemic stroke. And on the top here, we have this reference image we've been using. And let's say we get a clot, which is lodged into the left middle cerebral artery, which I've highlighted here. And again, this is quite a common site for having an ischemic stroke. So on the bottom, we have two CT images. And I'll give you a few seconds to look at the left CT image and see if you identify anything that's abnormal. So what you can see here on the left side is that there's this light enhancing region and this likely represents a ischemic clot which is lodged within the left middle cerebral artery and it's likely blocking off the blood supply to the region which is supplied by this artery. And on the CT on the right hand side you can see an example of the detrimental effect it can have to the tissue which is, being, which is normally supplied by the left middle cerebral artery.
And what's really interesting is that there are emerging techniques to try to treat these. So for example, there's something called a mechanical thrombectomy, where an interventional neuroradiologist will insert a wire, a catheter, into the radial artery, or for example, the femoral artery, and they will guide this wire up into the internal carotids, into the middle cerebral artery, through the clot, and they will suck the clot out to try to relieve the patient of their symptoms. So let's also briefly touch on the venous drainage of the brain. So when the brain receives the arterial blood supply and the brain is able to extract the oxygen it needs, the nutrients it needs, then the blood will enter into the venous system. So it'll enter into areas such as the cerebral veins, which you see here, and the cerebral veins will drain into larger dural venous sinuses, which I'm highlighting now. And the dural venous sinuses, they also, uh, they also collect cerebrospinal fluid, so CSF, from the subarachnoid space. And then the sinuses will eventually drain into the internal jugular vein, and the blood will return to the heart. In terms of the clinical relevance, so you can get something called a dural venous thrombosis. And the classic presentation of this is in a young female. And it typically presents with, for example, a headache, some visual disturbance, or other features of a stroke. But the big difference is that it is gradual in onset, and it commonly or most commonly occurs in the transverse sinus, which you can see is kind of in these areas here. So to summarize now, we've covered the arterial and the venous vasculature of the brain. And in terms of the arterial system, we looked at the anatomy, we looked at the circle of Willis specifically, we also looked at the parts of the brain and the regional supply of each of the arteries, so the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries. And then in terms of the clinical relevance, we focused on stroke and aneurysm and how the ruptured aneurysms can lead to subarachnoid hemorrhages. In terms of the venous system, we lightly touched on the anatomy as well as the clinical relevance, which can often be in the form of a dural venous sinus thrombosis. So I'd like to thank you for watching this video. We have a few other neuroanatomy videos um, via the NANSIG website and the YouTube channel at the moment, and there will be further ones coming along in the near future. Here's some further reading you might be interested to look into. Um, I didn't cover everything in depth. This was really just a brief overview. So if you want to look at anything in more detail, these are good places to start. And here are just some references and acknowledgments. Thank you again. Bye-bye.